my name is Patricia Stoddard, and I'm talking to you today about the Raleigh quilts of Pakistan and India. To me, the, the Raleigh's have been a quest. Um, it's something that I kind of happened upon a few years ago. I was living in Pakistan with my husband. He had the um, opportunity to be to have a military assignment in Pakistan. And when we got to Pakistan, we were in um, a, a large undecorated house. And I had several weeks of just plain white walls. And a, being a person who loves color, I went out um, to the marketplace and to some handicraft stores to find something beautiful to put on the wall. And um, what I found when I um, started looking through the textiles um, is that there is a wonderful variety of textiles in Pakistan. And later on, I found out in India. But uh, I, had, I spent a few hours going through a huge stack of textiles to find the perfect thing for my house. And it turned out that at the bottom of the stack was a quilt. And being a quilt lover, I recognized it immediately as something special. And I had just come from the, the eastern portion of the United States, the, the Amish area, where I had seen lots of Amish quilts. So I saw this quilt that was made in geometric patterns and solid colors as something kind of familiar to me. And I just loved it. And I bought it, took it home, and, and enjoyed it around the house. Now, um, a week went by, and we were still waiting for our uh, things to arrive from the states uh, to decorate our house with, and they hadn't they hadn't arrived yet. And so, I went to another handicraft store, and this time I found my second quilt. Now these quilts were they were the only ones in each of these respective stores, and they were kind of hidden on the bottom of stacks. But I found the second one, I thought, oh my goodness, this one is wonderful too. Again, it's geometric, it's striking, and it has a wonderful border on it. And so, bought it, took it home. And uh, another w week went by, and our thing still hadn't arrived, and so you're probably guessing the end of the story. I went back again, found another wonderful quilt, and um, by that time I was hooked. I was really, really curious about this tradition of quilting, um, especially since I had never heard it mentioned. So I started asking questions, and the, the shop owners could tell me a few things, and one of them was that it was mainly, these quilts were mainly made by the women of the desert region in southern Pakistan. So I found out that it was the province of Sindh, which is the southeast corner of Pakistan, which includes the huge city of Karachi, plus the, the Indus River, plus a large desert area. And these quilts were made from recycled cloth. They were made from um, hand-dyed cloth in many instances, and they were, they were an item that every family had. I also found, as I uh, start, now had my eyes tuned to looking for these quilts where, when I went out, that um, there were some that uh, had a different look. And so I, I got some of those too, but then I found out later that these were originally the bright colors that I'd seen in the first two, but the local merchants had dyed them to brown or blue or red because they thought that tourists might li like those better having fewer colors in them. And after I found that out, I asked them, please don't dye them until I take a look at them because I love the bright colors that they originally were. And then, uh, soon after that, I met a woman who was from the area and she told me that uh, she wanted to show me a few things. And these were Raleigh's. I, I found out that these quilts were called Raleigh's. These were Raleigh's that she had. This is one for her wedding and it had enormous glass mirrors on it, enormous meaning probably an inch and a half in diameter, covered with sequins, covered with mirrors, and it was used as a decoration piece in her wedding. And it was beautiful, and it was different. It was so different from the others. I still, my, my curiosity grew and grew as I kept seeing these different kinds of rallies. And this was also one my friend showed me. This one was a gift to her at her wedding. So. I could see that the tradition of these kind of quilts went from simple geometrics to very, very detailed 
appliqued and mirrored and embellished quilts. As you can see from this one, it has 28 identical blocks in it. And these blocks are made from very fine, fine-lined applique. Some of the applique pieces are being only one-eighth of an inch wide. And also on this one, lots of mirrors, lots of borders. Uh, and uh, the borders were all varied designs and colors. And around the edge of this entire quilt are silk tassels with beads. So this one definitely was one of the very finest and highest quality of Raleigh's. And then, as I kept my eyes open, I, I sort of was on my radar now to look for these quilts. I discovered that there was strong cultural meaning to the Raleigh quilts. This man, for example, is wearing a patched hat. And patchwork is one of the major designs of Raleigh's. His patched hat means something. It meant that because he didn't have enough fabric for a, a hat that was whole and complete, the little patches indicated his poverty, and he was a beggar. And so he would go around, and the symbolism of the patched hat was that he was uh, a person without much and that he was harmless, and that he was just looking for help if anyone wanted to help him, but he would not hurt them. And so, if, as you can see from the, his picture and also from uh, the quilt that is next to it, that is also a symbol of uh, not having much. It's a humble little quilt made of patches of all sorts of different fabrics. And um, interestingly, this pattern of the, the, um, the triangles running in different patterns is, a, uh, is called, uh, by the women there, flying birds. And we have a similar one in the West, a, a quilting pattern called flying geese. I found out as I started asking lots and lots of questions about these, these quilts that Raleigh's are used for a variety of purposes. Their number one purpose is as a, a covering for the, the wooden beds that they use in this part of the world. These wooden beds are called charpoy, and they stand about a, between a foot and a foot and a half off the ground, and then they're, they're strung with rope or some kind of a, um, a webbing that, um, between the, the legs of the frame uh, to make a bed. And that's a little bit uncomfortable, so usually a Raleigh is placed on top of the webbing, and the person lays on that, and then depending on the, the heat or the cold, they will pull Raleigh's over them for a comfortable sleeping. When the, uh, the, the bed covering, the Raleigh, is, is worn out or has maybe some damage to it, it often becomes an object that people use in their work. And for example, this, these little boys on this cart here, if you see right there is a Raleigh on their cart, and they probably haul things. And maybe something delicate would be um, put on this or covered with this as they do their work. Another um, place where you see Raleigh's is just uh, in daily life. One of the, this is a, the wall of a Shamiana, a tent. And as you can see, the motifs here are, are pieced fabric and designs. And these kind of designs are often seen on the quilts that are put on the beds. This boat here uh, was going down the Indus River and there are folded Raleigh's on the benches where people sit. Over here, this picture is of a snake charmer. He's, this man is a jogi, and uh, that, his job is to, as you can see, to charm snakes and also to catch snakes. And um, so jogis are useful in many, many communities, and, and their work also results in um, uh, having snakes to be uh, available to their National Health Institute for anti-snake venom. But as you can see down here, this little bag that's patchwork is a, is a Raleigh bag. So this little quilt is used as a work, uh, is beautiful and is also used as a work object. Now here is another example of how um, common Raleigh's are. This was a village meeting down in the southern part of the Sindh in Pakistan, and there wasn't a, a large tent or meeting hall, so everyone was asked to bring a Raleigh, and the Raleigh's were placed were hung up in 
became the walls of this meeting hall and were also placed on the floor for people to sit on. So um, you can see that every household had, had one, at least one that was brought, and uh, they were placed around to make the walls. And very beautiful. And you can see, get an idea of the number of different patterns of Raleigh's just by looking at this photo and, and looking at the different walls, the patterns on the walls. So after I got this far, I really uh, was very committed to finding out more about these quilts. And so the research really began after that because I realized as I was asking around for information that um, very little had been done to document these quilts or to um, preserve them. So I started asking questions. And um, I went to different groups of women. I collected photos. Um, I took, took photos and asked women to tell me the patterns and also met with groups of women that would, um, where they could explain to me about their quilts. And I, I found that women were very, very happy to share this, this information and knowledge because this is one of their big life's works. The quilts are not easy to make and they are, they're time consuming and they, they, they put a lot of their artistic abilities into these quilts. I also went to any time that they were on display, I would go and, um, and take a look at these quilts. These two photos happen to be uh, from the uh, National Folk Art Museum in Pakistan and uh, they were having displays of quilts. So as you can see from these photos, these were from an area in the Sindh that there were lots of different patterning on the quilts. And uh, here was a woman here showing how the quilts are made. You might notice from this that she has a reed mat on the floor and that she is sitting on the ground. And I learned that that's one of the, well that is the way that these quilts are made is by having them on the ground. I also took some trips into Sindh and met with some women in the villages. And again, this is in central Sindh in a, in a Mirapur Khas and Umarkot in middle Sindh. And as you can see, the women have lots and lots of textile handiwork. That's one of the things that they, they do there, not only for um, utility, because they make their clothes, they make their bedding, they make their um, special bags to store things in, but it's also a form of enjoyment and artistic expression for them. And you can see over here, this is another town that the, just a variety of patterning you can find in the same town. So I kind of, my, as my research went along, I kind of, I developed some objectives. And the first one was, I realized that, that some collecting of the Raleigh's needed to take place so that they could be documented. And also I realized that some of them were were changing traditions fairly quickly that um, and the, from the point that I was there that it would be really important to to make some collections so we know what had gone on the patterns that had been used and the patterns that were um, perhaps changing so so that's what I did I set out to make a collection of fine examples of different varieties of Raleigh quilts for historical appreciation and research purposes a second objective I had was to build awareness of Raleigh's in the world of textiles through exhibits and a book. And I did end up writing a book on the Raleigh's and uh, have been working on various exhibits around the country and in different countries. And I also was hoping to build a market for newly made Raleigh's so that there would be income opportunities for women and also be able to keep the tradition of Raleigh making alive. So one of the uh, things I discovered is I was um, researching these Raleigh's is there are certain characteristics that were true to most Raleigh's. One of them is they are made of cotton. There has been some change recently that the fabric has become synthetic, uh, particularly polyester, um, but the traditional way of making Raleigh's was of all cotton. And um, the, the fabric is mostly hand dyed fabric to get those particular colors that are important in the Raleigh tradition. Raleigh's can be very simple and everyday useful items, or they can be very, very elegant. Uh, the elegant ones tend to be the gifts for weddings, uh, gifts to special people, 
and also like the one we saw with all the mirrors, almost a decorative piece for um, particularly weddings. There are many design variations. The three categories that the Raleigh makers will tell you, um, and these are the indigenous um, categories of these quilts are number one, patchwork, which results are usually uh, more simple in, um, in, the, in the look, but very dramatic often, so patchwork geometrics. Uh, applique with many different kinds of shapes and, and also embroidered quilts that are embroidered throughout. And one thing I noticed too about the Raleigh's is I figured it out, really millions of people throughout the Raleigh making region uh, use these quilts on a daily basis. The Raleigh making region itself is the Sindh area of Pakistan, which is uh, in the southeast corner. Uh, it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's a place where people have lived for millennia, and the Indus River runs right through the, through the center of it. And then on the side, uh, the, the people there also make Raleigh's, including Rajasthan in India and Gujarat in India, which is below it. And also, um, going to the north of Sindh in the lower Punjab region of Pakistan, and in the Baluchistan area over here um, to the west are people that use and make and use Raleigh's. Now Raleigh's come from a very diverse, from very diverse areas. And basically all the people in, the, uh, in these regions I just described use Raleigh's to some extent, particularly those people who are, um, have fewer resources and, and need to use the recycled material for things like their bedding. So they can come from uh, the small towns, like this one pictured here with the adobe buildings and the, um, and the basic, basic utilities. They also come from the nomadic groups. There are several nomadic groups that spend most of their life traveling across this area of the world. And they also make these Raleigh's. And also from some people in the big cities as well. The Raleigh's are uh, made by a wide variety of cultural groups. They, you have um, from r different religions, from different occupations, they all make Raleigh's. Now, so the sewing the Raleigh is interesting when you compare it to how it's done in the West. Uh, normally here we would be on chairs above the ground uh, with a frame to hold the fabric taut as the stitching is done. And with the Raleigh's, however, they're done on the ground. There's a reed mat that's placed on the ground to keep the fabric from getting dirty. Uh, a backing fabric is placed down on the reed mat. And usually this is uh, something that has been patched together um, from s larger scraps of material or an old, old head shawl or some, some sort of fabric like that that's a larger piece. And then little scraps of fabric are placed on top of the bottom layer. And these little scraps of fabric make up the filling. Now, it's not like the, the batting that is used here. It is actually just small scraps of, of various kinds of fabric. And they are laid on to uh, maybe a layer of three or five um, levels of this uh, scrap fabric. It is then basted on, the scrap fabric is basted onto the back with a two inch, uh, about a two inch stitch. And just to hold it in place because these pieces are very small. And then the top of the, uh, the, the top layer of the quilt is laid on top. Now the quilters, um, the, the common way that it's done is to invite, once you get it to that point, you invite your friends, your neighbors over for a little quilting bee. And it, if four women are working on it, they will each sit on a side and make sort of a human quilting frame. They, they, they put pressure on to kind of pull it taut. And each of these women will sew in a straight line parallel to the edge. And um, when they get to a certain point, then they will stop. And the people that are, the, the two women that are on the shorter ends of the, 
of the quilt will turn about a foot in usually. They will turn and also and then join the others and stitch parallel lines in the center going the length of the quilt. And with this kind of human cooperation, the quilts become very, uh, very sturdy and, and very even. This is a close-up of uh, what it looks like with the woman who has made this quilt. She was starting at the outside edge, and she was actually doing this one by herself, which is more difficult. But um, she's got her straight parallel lines set and has gone around the edge, so then the, the, all those pieces are held together and prepared for her to start doing the parallel line stitching. The stitching is a running stitch, and it is uh, very close together. In most cases, it's um, three eighths of an inch or less clo uh, between the parallel lines of stitching. Now, the Raleigh designs, as we've seen, we have the, the geometric designs, we have the, the um, appliques that are of all different shapes. Um, they're just a wonderful variety of designs. Some of the principles, some of the general principles about Raleigh design are these. Number one, the Raleigh's have a central field in them, and uh, surrounding this field are one or two borders. In a lot of the geometric patterns, it's symmetry that creates the balance. So symmetry is very important in those geometric patterns. The, another principle of design is when there is a color, when there are various colors used, they are placed in a diagonal line versus a horizontal or vertical line. And these diagonal lines and the use of triangles create a sense of movement in the design. And they're also, the colors that are used are very strong hues and are they're placed, oftentimes complementary colors are placed next to each other so they create contrast and, and make the colors pop out. For example, reds and greens are often placed together, oranges and blues are often placed together, and colors in, in white and black is a very common characteristic in the color scheme. This is a, a diagram of uh, what we were just talking about. So, so over here we see the, this is a, a diagram of, a, of a, a simple Raleigh where you have a center field and they call it a barrow, meaning flower bed. And the different blocks are called ghouls or flowers is the translation. And this uh, use of the word ghoul is also seen in, in carpets, in oriental carpets, uh, Central Asian carpets where the, the symbols are called ghouls. And then surrounding the central center field are borders. And they sometimes are plain colors and sometimes they have applique designs on them, but there's often three to five borders around your center field. And these are some of the borders that you commonly see. One is this row of cones. They like to, they call it the cone style of border. Then there's ones with little chevrons called date palm or camel cart. Uh, quite often in the geometrics are these half squares, and then here's a set of triangles. And this one here, initially I thought it looked like a flower, but turns out it's the head of a milk churn, and it's called Mondero. So oftentimes, as you can see here, with the flowers and the palm, date palms and the milk churn, the the, uh, the names of the parts of the quilt and, and names of designs relate to daily life. They are things they see, things they know, and uh, are part of their quilts as well. Traditional colors in the Raleigh quilts, um, there are seven traditional colors, and they call them the Sat Rangi, or seven colors. Um, red, yellow, and uh, sometimes orange, green, purple, dark blue, and white are often seen in the quilts. Some communities, such as the Beale community, and this woman is one of the Beals, they have their own unique color schemes. And for example, in their community, they like to use burgundy, gold, sage green, and a white. Now let's talk about the three different styles of quilts. The first one is probably the one that is seen most often. 
especially uh, in the villages and the and the stacks that families have for their um, for their quilt storage. This kind of quilt is a patchwork quilt, and it's. Um, it has some very ancient origins, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But the designs on the patchwork quilt are often very bold. They're very straightforward and geometric. So as you can see, this one has very, um, uh, it's, it's a very bold pattern, and it's a very striking pattern. And one of the things that the, the women think about when they make the patterns on their quilts is how does it look at night? How does it look under the stars? And I thought this was just a delightful thought because um, many of these people sleep outside at night. Their, their households aren't big enough for everyone to sleep inside. And so the thought of how your quilt looks under the stars, I think, is just um, makes me smile when I think about that. Here's another geometric pattern. And as you can see, this one is perhaps a little more complex than the one we saw earlier. There's different levels of design. Um, you can look at it as if you pick out the white, um, the right crosses, or maybe the blocks, or whatever. There's there's a lot going on here, and it's a very pleasing um, pattern. As you can see, as we talked about earlier, the borders. Here's a, a first border with a little cone design. Here's a triangle border and a and a solid border. And most Raleigh's will have some sort of bordering to go with it. This one, to me, feels very contemporary. It just is a strong and um, balanced pattern, a very, but some complicated elements. One of the things that I noticed about this one is when we talk about the, the, the setting of the diagonal patterning, it's very subtle, but in here, the, uh, the background of the blocks is, uh, follows the diagonal pattern. Here's this block has a white background and it goes to the one here with a white and that one with a white. And then the black follows the diagonal pattern going up this way and again the white. So you often find in the Raleigh quilt some kind of diagonal placement. This one is a mixture of what is called a nine patch geometric pattern, meaning nine blocks decorated, however, and um, an applique. And this applique design is uh, is something that's very common throughout South, South Asians, and um, it's the representational of the lotus, the lotus flower. Um, again, you see that the, uh, there is a diagonal placement of the, the blocks going this way and, and up to that way. And here, these, all the pinks are placed in a diagonal line, and the ones with the ba black background are placed in a diagonal line. Oftentimes, um, the, these quilts are made by people of various uh, religious backgrounds. A lot of the communities there are defined by which religion they are, Muslim or Hindu. And if you see the quilt with lots of pink and green in it, that is, those are the, some of the favorite colors of the Hindu quilters. So by looking at this, you could almost certainly say is it was done in one of the Hindu communities. Okay, another, uh, the second large category of Raleigh's is the appliqued Raleigh's. Now, applique means having a, a piece of fabric uh, cut into a shape, and then it is sewed onto a, a backing fabric. And so that's where the patterning comes from. It's not necessarily one colored piece of fabric, but it's the pattern that's placed on the fabric. And the the cutout uh, fabric on the top is the edges are then turned under and stitched in little tiny stitches so that you cannot really see those stitches, but they will hold the fabric onto the backing. Now, um, the, the kinds of applique designs can, can be um, very, very complicated by the way that they do it. For example, in this quilt, the bl applique blocks on this uh, quilt are um, folded up like you would a paper snowflake. And then little snips are made in the paper, or not in the paper, in the fabric, and then they're folded under and, and appliqued on. So these um, uh, blocks here are each done in that way. Here is, a, you can see this block is uh, almost looks like flower petals on it. This one is, 
is lines. This one is something else figurative. So there's many, many different styles and designs of applique. And again, we see the diagonal placement of the, the blocks so that they, they run in uh, diagonal lines. And this one is interesting, too, because in this part of the sin, and this is the lower sin, this border is very, very popular. It's this red border here with a, the white shapes. And these are, um, and these go all around. They, they, they're sashing bands, all these blocks. And this is also, this border is also appliqued. So the background fabric is white, and then a red strip is placed on top where the little spaces has been cut out. So it makes a really interesting border. And then again, as we've got the plain, plainer borders around it. This one is, again, an applique quilt from the same region. And as you can see, this one has um, got a, a whole lot of design going on with it. It's a six-block quilt, so you have the these six larger blocks. In the center of the six larger blocks is a white applique. And this one even has a mirror in the middle with some sequins to make it extra sparkly. And then we've got red triangles on each of the sides. And then some extra yellow coming out here and then white triangles filling in the space and then more mirrors. So this is a, this would have taken more time and energy. And um, usually the more decorations and embellishments you get on a quilt, like the mirrors and the sequins, means it was a quilt that was made for a special occasion. Could have been a wedding, could have been a gift, uh, something like that. This one also has a very interesting outer border on it with um, orange and blue shapes that are appliqued and sewn in the outer border. This one is interesting in that um, it is not quite as symmetrical as all the others we've seen. It is uh, what they, the women call a new pattern. Now, I'm not sure how new new is. It could be hundreds of years old, but it is newer than what they consider the other ones were. And the interesting thing is they, they say that they like to do this kind of quilt because it's faster. And the reason why it's faster is be, instead of making lots of small blocks to completely cover the area, the background of this quilt here is one larger piece of fabric. And then the appliques are sort of, uh, they're placed on there and then sewed into place. But you still have lots of um, space that is not decorated with applique. And so that does make it faster. It probably cuts her the production time down about half on, on this center field of the quilt. But it does make a very, very interesting pattern and very appealing to see all these applique designs in, on the quilt. This one is also one of those that it would be considered a new design. And this has a black um, field to it and some appliques are around. Actually, this one is one of our family favorites, and we call it flying pizzas because of this round shape in the middle and these things that remind us of pizza slices going around, orbiting around the center pizza. Um, I'm sure that wasn't what was intended, but uh, we just enjoy this one a lot. One of the things you can see from this with the, the black background in the center is you can see the stitching lines very faintly going across this quilt. And one of the things that they will often do with the stitching is to change colors. So you might have six rows of uh, stitching that are in one color, say white, and another six rows that are in yellow, another might be in red, another might be in black. So it creates an underlining kind of a stripe pattern. So you get different levels of patterning, which is, again, very, very interesting to look at. This one here is a unusual in that it is a black background with white applique on it and no other colors. And these are very complex applique uh, shapes in here. And as you can see, there's lots of, lots of uh, detail. And so this took some very intricate folding. Like, we, like I said, it was like a snowflake, uh, the paper snowflake that uh, 
we've all made. Uh, but this is the folding is done with the fabric or the, the fabric and then snipped and then turned under. So each of these has a very ornate pattern and and this quilt also has a simple border of of these little uh, applique shapes versus some of the multiple borders we've seen in the other quilts. This one is from more northern sand and it's very interesting in that uh, the, the center field or flower bed is made up of both applique blocks and embroidered blocks. So you can see, let's look at the, um, the orange ones first. These are applique and they are, um, so it's a dark background, orange applique was set on top and then in those spaces that could have been black, they have also put in other colored fabric. So you get this multicolored effect from the applique with some other colored fabric stuffed into the spaces before the stitching is done. So you get these multicolored uh, blocks. And as you can see here how they're placed on the diagonal running down the quilt. Now the ones, the blocks that have a white background, these are actually embroidered. And they are embroidered with some stitches that are um, some would be known to embroiderers here, but uh, there are a few stitches that are unique to South Asia, and they often use those. One of those is called the Hormuch stitch, which is a, uh, a form of interlacing stitch, but it is, um, takes a lot of skill to do it. It's a beautiful stitch. Now, another thing to notice on this quilt are the borders. As you see, we have lots of, we have several borders. One, two, three, four, five, six borders before we reach the center field and also very busy borders. There's a lot going on here. But I'd like to point out this border right here. This border is a very um, a special design and it's, and it's also seen in Central Asian quilts. And the name of this, uh, Central Asian rugs, excuse me, and the name of this design is the stepped square design. So as you can see, it's a step, a step effect going up and down, which can also be achieved through woven with the warp and the weft, making those straight lines. But in this case, it is done in the quilts. And this is a very common border that is uh, used throughout Northern Sindh. With the applique quilts especially, um, there are lots of embellishments. So for anyone that likes bling, you'll like these quilts. Um, these embellishments can include mirrors, and we've seen mirrors already in some of these quilts. These little circles uh, that you can see in the picture, uh, if they have any size to them at all, more than likely are mirrors. And they're also sequins. So for example, in this border, you see these little uh, black milk churn shapes and in the center is a little little spot of light and that's a sequin and there's also many other sequins in this quilt. Uh, there's embroidery and this uh, picture is a little small for us to see but there's lots of little embroidered uh, details that are around. Oftentimes in the embellishment will be also pom-poms, um, little wool or cotton pom-poms. Uh, could be shells and also tassels. And as we can see on this quilt, in the corners are tassels, the little metal pieces that would make a, a sweet little jingling sound when the, when the quilt is being moved. Up in Northern Sindh, tassels and, and fringe on the edge of the quilt is really very common and um, will go maybe like four inches down the sides and at the corners or sometimes all around the quilt. Now our third kind of quilt that we're going to talk about is the embroidered Raleigh. And these Raleigh's are embroidered throughout. They are made by uh, two specific groups. Um, one is the nomadic Samis who are, agri well they, they are herders, they herd animals and they have their headquarters in southern Pakistan. But they will go every year over to Iran and, over, and then back over through India but they, their um, stopping spot basically is in, is in Pakistan and that's where they will hold their weddings and their other special occasions. 
And they are known for these quilts. They are incredible embroiderers. And so they're, the layers of the quilts are held together by not only a running stitch, but also embroidery stitches. And they use many, many different kinds of embroidery stitches to decorate these quilts. So this one that um, we're just looking at, it has a black field in the middle. And so these decorations here is, are not a printed fabric, but are the embroidery that is uh, put on. And you can see through the middle and uh, throughout this design that there is the sense of a stripe. And the stripe is actually made from very, very close stitching of the running stitch in different colors, as mentioned before. Now the border on this quilt is just made from the red fabric that is was sewed on as a border piece. And this red fabric also is embellished and decorated with um, embroidery. And as you can see, the, the embroidery used around the outside is slightly different than that which is on the inside. So it creates a different effect. It really does feel like a border, that it's something different. Now one of the things they, they will do sometimes is on the middle, instead of using a plain colored fabric, the plain is the most common and black is the most common color. But sometimes if they find a really special piece of fabric they like, they will put that in the middle and then uh, put uh, the black around the outside and again do the rows and rows and rows of embroidery. This kind of quilt is made like the other ones with the, um, the quilter starting on the outside edge and working towards the middle. Um, it is often done over time, but it's amazing how regular most of the stitching is and how even it ends out in the, in the end. This quilt is unusual. Not often are they signed, but this one is does have a signature right here in the fabric, but it is a man's name. So we assume that it was the name of the person the quilt was made for or the quilt belonged to. This one is another one and showing the traditional black background and um, the rows and rows of stitching. And this one, instead of having a border on it, is all black. And uh, there are a few spots that are, this one is a, a patch right here. If you can see it from the back, there's a burn hole in it. And that is one of the damages that often comes from the Raleigh quilts because if uh, people are outside and they have a fire to keep warm or cook food, um, sometimes there's a spark or a, you know, some kind of damage can happen. So that's what that little orange spot was on this particular quilt. One of uh, the ways of keeping the tradition alive, the Raleigh tradition alive, is to having some uh, women in, in communities who are interested in earning a little income make Raleigh's for sale. And so this is the community of Miti in Southern Sand and they have a co-op and these are, this is an example of one of the quilts that they have made for sale. Um, the market for the Raleigh quilts right now is, uh, there are some people in, the, in their local communities that will buy them for gifts if they uh, need a, a wedding gift or they have a special need and they will buy one that's already made. And the other market would be outside of Pakistan or India and uh, many people in Europe like these and also in the United States. Now one thing that people often wonder about is where, uh, how old are these quilts? And one of the clues comes from the, the motifs that are used on the quilts. Now um, there was a great civilization that, served, that thrived in the Indus region, that means the area around the Indus River in ancient times. In fact, there are findings back to 6000 BC of cities and of communities that lived in that area. And uh, to give you an idea, that predates some of the, even the Egyptian um, uh, findings to have a civilization live that long ago. The picture here is of a city called Mohenjo-Daro, um, which is in the central part of Pakistan. But you can see it was, this is just a snapshot of part of it, but it was a very great city with many houses and buildings and, and things. During that time, some of the findings include, uh, of course, cotton fabric. It would be very hard for that to survive. 
but they have found a small, small piece that was wrapped around a silver uh, vase. And so they do know that even very far back they made cotton and it was colored so they were di it was dyed. And there are accounts of the cotton fabric from this part of the world being sent to Rome for Roman togas. They really love the cotton, the cotton. And this was also the first part of the world that really domesticated cotton and learned how to spin it. Cotton was a little bit trickier than some of the other fibers. And um, the, it was the, the craftsmen in this part of the world that figured out how to actually spin the cotton and make, and make fabric out of it. So that, uh, so now we can see, even if you go there today, you can see uh, cotton being carried around um, it, it being being grown, being harvested, being transported to market, and also being dyed. Now, um, so we know the cotton tradition has been around a long time. Uh, another tradition that has been around a long time are the bangles that the women wear. And uh, you may have noticed in some of the pictures we've already seen that women have these white bracelets going up their arms. And there are ancient graves where they have found women's, uh, this is from the time of some of these ancient cities where they have find, found women with white bracelets on their arms. Um, and today what the women do is if uh, they wear these white bangles, now they're plastic, but they wear them on their lower arm until they are married. And then when they get married, then they, they add the, on the upper arm. So it's a symbol. It's a very, very old tradition. And it's a symbol to people that know them, what their marital status is. So the, um, that just uh, those two examples of the cotton and the bracelets give you an idea of how long the traditions um, go in this part of the world. It's a, it's a corner of the world where traditions are kept for a very, very long time. Now, uh, we're going to take a little detour here. We're going to look at the pottery that was found in some of these archaeological digs in this part of the world. Now, this pot right here was excavated in a city called Pirak, which is now in present-day Baluchistan, which would be a little bit to the west of Sindh. But in Pirak, um, they, the, the skill of painted pottery was, was uh, very strong and very highly appreciated. But if you look very closely into these designs, um, they are, they are uh, bordered squares. And if you look at each of these squares here on this particular pot, they are all designs that are still seen in the Raleigh quilts. And they also have borders here that are still seen in the Raleigh quilts. And archaeologists have, um, have speculated, actually, that women were the painters of these pots because they were able to find um, some, some fingerprints in the paint. And they were very small ones. And so they have supposed for many years that these uh, pots were painted by women. And so um, one of the things that I was very curious about was how many or what kind of designs are, were on these ancient painted pots that are also on the Raleigh quilts today. So I started to just compare some of the pictures of the, the pottery fragments with quilts that um, are, are being made today. So this is one where we can see that lines at right angles, having lines come down, making a, a shape, a diamond or a square in the center, is a, is a motif that um, was found on the pots. This is the top edge of this particular pot, and this is the quilt design. Another thing, a uh, design feature that was seen all over the pots were zigzag lines. And so this is a, the side of a pot where it's a, a cross and all these zigzag lines and zigzag lines in there as well. And you can see the, how the borders of these of Raleigh's today even carry these zigzag lines. Square set on end. This was the picture of the first quilt I ever saw. And you can see in this pot here, this is the top edge of the pot with the borders. 
but how dare these checkerboard squares sit on end in this particular pot. This one is uh, different lines forming squares. So this is the top edge of the pot, and here's the block, and with the sashing and the squares in the middle and the, and the triangles, it's this very same pattern that's in this quilt today. Here is one that uh, I think find very interesting because it's a pr fairly complex pattern with the cross and the three lines, square in the middle, and the checkerboard here, which is just the same as this portion over here. And there are also this idea of four triangles forming a square with banding in the middle is very much like all the blocks on this um, quilt here. And then the, the space in between is small zigzag lines, which is the same pattern in this quilt as well. This one has small triangles forming larger triangles, and this pot with the top edge up here and this quilt have almost the identical pattern when you look at it with the use of the triangles and also the triangles in the border. There are also tribal tombs that are still visible in, um, in Pakistan and southern Sindh. That, have, that are carved with the blocks, also looking very much like the Raleigh quilt designs. And these here would be, they were on, carved in the tomb and look very much like borders. Um, these tribal tombs, of course, were much later than the pots. But the very interesting thing about these painted pots is about 1000 BC, the, the pots that the archaeologists have found um, stopped having patterns on them. They became plain. And so from that point, from 1000 BC till now, the, the pottery has remained plain. But the same patterns have survived somehow uh, onto the quilts. And I think easily, just like those white bangle bracelets have, that tradition has survived, that the textile tradition has survived by going mother to daughter uh, throughout the centuries. So this intriguing question is, could the textiles of Raleigh's, with Raleigh patterns, have been a transmitter of cultural patterns for 2,500 years from the end of design pottery to the tomb carvings and on to today? It's a very intriguing question, and um, I don't know if we'll ever know the answer, but I think it's, it's, there clearly are similarities between the, the ancient pottery in this part of the world and the, the fabric patterns on the Raleigh quilts today. So this is it, the end of uh, the presentation about Raleigh quilts, and I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you get a chance someday to see some Raleigh quilts in person and really appreciate the craftsmanship and the color and uh, the, the pure creativity in these quilts that the, the women, these, these women from uh, remote areas of Pakistan um, have put together. They really put their love into it. They, they make them for their families. They make them to be something beautiful and to be enjoyed under the stars. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.